Okay, so you know how in Revenge of the Sith, Obi-Wan says that weird line where he's like, I have the high ground. And yeah. then Anakin's also like, you can't underestimate my power. And he's like, don't try it. And then he does a flip and he cuts him in half. And like, it feels very out of place. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So the reason why it fits is what's happening is Obi-Wan is saying, I have the moral high ground. He doesn't right. really have that much of a, I have the high ground. And then what happens is he's testing Anakin's pride because, and I didn't know this for a while, but Anakin, so if you, you got to know your prequel. You shift back to episode one when Darth Maul and Obi-Wan are fighting when Obi-Wan's very young. Obi-Wan does a flip over Darth Maul in order to get better positioning, and that's when he cuts him in half. So Anakin goes, you underestimate my power, and, and he goes, don't try it, because Anakin's going to do the same move that Obi-Wan did back in episode one, because they've obviously talked about it. So Anakin tries it. He does. They're not even playing field he's a little bit higher he does uh -huh. it he tries to do the flip and Obi-Wan cuts him in half which Darth Maul wasn't able to do so basically Anakin was like I can do the move that you did to defeat Darth Maul and then Obi-Wan kills him or doesn't kill wow. him but cuts him in half wow. what's cool too is that the same move that Darth Maul uses to kill Qui-Gon Jinn in Clone Wars because I know you're watching Clone Wars with your boy right now mm -hmm. so Clone Wars you'll eventually get to a scene where Darth Maul is back and he faces off with Obi-Wan spoiler alert I guess but yeah, he faces off with Obi-Wan on Tatooine uh -huh. and Darth Maul tries to do the same move that he does I didn't know like you have to like know someone who like Why? really dissects this stuff <laughs> Darth Maul tries to do the same move to kill Qui-Gon Jinn that he used to kill Qui-Gon Jinn on Obi-Wan mm -hmm. and Obi-Wan is able to deflect it and kills Darth Maul with it cool really cool <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, welcome to the Back to Basics podcast, uh, hosted by Guardian Test Prep. If you are studying for your national registry exam and want to pass it, well, that's what we're here for. So go, go to guardiantestprep.com. We'll help you pass that national registry exam. But our Back to Basics podcast is geared towards really anyone in emergency care who's interested in uh, topics in the emergency field. And again, we take them back to basics. We make them simple to understand. And today, this is the second part of a three-part series maybe pretty three much part. maybe three-part series uh on pediatrics but before that we do have a sponsor today so today's sponsor is advanced rescue education solutions llc abbreviated aries a-r-e-s and you can check them out at ariesmedsolutions.com that's their website i recently spoke with their uh ceo and, and kind of owner founder great guy totally in line with what we like to do wants to offer affordable cheap very informative and fun education to pre-hospital providers. So what they do is he's got uh, licensing in lots of states, but he does like hybrid programs or a, a traditional program. So you're either in class or you're partly in class and partly online. Um, and his hybrid programs, I was looking over some of his stuff. They're, they're pretty stellar lectures that we're going to get on, uh, on guardian CME, I believe, which is, which will be fun. Awesome. But what he does is uh, AHA stuff. He does NREMT stuff and he does advanced um, NREMT stuff, but he doesn't do medic yet. Um, but great company. They also have this partner fund, which is really cool. This partner, there's a kind of sister company called the Aries responder relief project. What's really cool about this is if you decide to donate to this project, it's designed to help people get through school. So he'll, he'll fund their school, whether they're going through his or not. Oh, very cool. But I think he said something like his is somewhere around like a thousand bucks for an ENT class or whatever. So if you donate a thousand bucks, he'll put them through that. But let's say they want to go to some community college and it's 2000 over there. Well, it'll go towards that education too. So he's awesome. not afraid of the competition or anything like that. Just wants to support people. That's called the Aries responder relief project. And you can find more information about that at ariesmedsolutions.com. Cool. Very A R E S. Cool. Very cool company. And they've been a big supporter of us, so we want to be a big supporter of them. Awesome. Yeah, well, we do appreciate their sponsorship here today. Today, we are going to be talking about, again, this is the second part in a potentially three-part series here on pediatrics. We talked uh, last time on pediatric assessment and how do we assess pediatric patients in a systematic way that allows us to recognize, are they sick, are they not sick, uh, and then kind of what what's causing that uh, that illness. Now, really the focus here is on, on on critically ill or potentially critically ill pediatric patients. If you haven't listened to our assessment lecture, we encourage you to go back and listen to that. We're not going to kind of go over all of that again today. Uh, you can check that out, um, like I said, either on Spotify or on our YouTube channel uh, to see what we talked about there. But, we, but the goal of the way we are trying to assess pediatric patients and work through this kind of algorithm is to say, are they sick? Are they not sick? And then what is causing their issues so that we can prevent 
the worst case scenario, which is them going into cardiac arrest. There are two things that will put a kid into cardiac arrest. Now, this is a little bit of a generalization, but we do like to take it back to basics. And if we're going to kind of, you know, put a format out there for this, respiratory emergencies and shock are the two things that are going to potentially propagate a uh, pediatric patient going into cardiac arrest. So today we want to focus on that respiratory component. We talked about assessment at this point in our, you know, in our algorithm or in our workflow, we've assessed that the patient is sick. We think it's a respiratory issue. um, And we're going to talk about what do we do about that? So of the respiratory issues out there, which ones should we focus in on? What kind of things could be going on? How do we intervene and how do we treat so that we can protect that child from decompensating further? Absolutely. So here's how we'll start. We will, we will just review the assessment really fast. So, because it may have been a while since you listened to that. Just I so you can so, just so you can see, <laughs> just so you can see where, how we got here. Okay. So when we start with our initial assessment in a pediatric patient, we start with a pediatric assessment triangle. That's going to look at three things, appearance, work of breathing and circulation. That gives us an idea of whether the patient seems to be sick or not sick. And we, mm-hmm. we kind of define that as like stable or unstable, compensating or decompensating. We'll get into that further, right? So that's our initial impression, just our at the door assessment. And then we would move into our traditional primary assessment. We would do A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. And we talked a little bit about how we look at different things than we would look at with adults, right? Where we look at more cap refill over blood pressure. We look at more, you know, questions for mom and dad than asking the kids things directly. We're not necessarily going to get an anal times four. We might get an av poo. And you can hear all about that in the other podcast. So the other episode. Um, so once we get through that, then we move on to our secondary assessment, which is our sample history and our um, our information gathering, getting vital signs like that. So after we have all this information, we've built this out, we are now suspecting that there is either, like you said, a respiratory or a shock issue. And in this case, using the PAT and using our assessment skills, we're thinking that it's probably a respiratory issue. So before we even get into what kind of respiratory issues we see and how we can define whether that respiratory issue is um, distress or failure, where we have compensation or decompensation, Um, Let's talk a little bit about just pediatric airway anatomy and and why it's different. We started our last episode on the pediatric topic about how adults or kids are not little adults, right? Kids are Mm -hmm. different, kind of different beings medically when it comes to um, assessment and treatment. So this is a lot of the reasons why. So why don't you walk us through a little bit to some of the differences about pediatric airways. And the reason we focus in on this is because like I said, the most common cause of cardiac arrest in pediatrics is a respiratory issue, is hypoxia, right? So, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, because primary cardiac issues like we see in adults, like heart attacks and strokes don't happen in kids as often because they don't have coronary vascular disease yet. They don't have, you know, uh, plaque buildup and atherosclerosis in their vessels and things like that. Um, but they do obviously said have differences in their airways and things that can predispose them to more complicated respiratory issues. The other thing we'll emphasize again, before we start here is just that children compensate for a longer period of time than adults do. So when a child starts to decompensate, they decompensate much more quickly, which again, is that why we put this emphasis on recognizing sick kids early and intervening early so that they don't decompensate. Right. So in kids, there's a couple different things when we talk about their airway, their airway in general, you, you may see this on the national registry exam um, and that type of thing. So it, it's good to remember as well um, is there's a couple different things we see that are different in a pediatric airway than an adult airway. So the pediatric airway, first of all, it's smaller. Because pediatric people are smaller than adult people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. but even relatively though, is, is what you mean too, right? Right. right even right. relatively to the, patient size their, their airway face. is smaller right so their airway is smaller another thing is that they we 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 said this in our last podcast on the assessment is that they're obligate nose breathers um so b- meaning that they like primarily breathe through their nose like as adults we primarily breathe through our mouth as we get older i mean it's like you probably shouldn't i think that there's some like benefit to there's a to bunch breathe. of yeah i got this guy at the station who's a crazy health guy yeah uh, but also Maybe I shouldn't say this, but also kind of like weird into like the whole mushrooms thing too. Like, but okay. he, he just really, not even necessarily like psychedelic mushrooms, oh, but, okay. but probably included in there. <laughs> just, just so you know, to give you an idea of this okay. guy, he's a little bit of like a hippie health guru guy, okay. but he like quoted all this research to me recently about how nose breathing is like so important when it comes to like 
power lifting and like being able to like oxygenate the brain and yeah. because like you need that filtered and it like I don't know it does something there are where like he like hyper oxygenates you through nose yeah. breathing rather than mouth breathing. There are people who can move objects just by breathing through their nose. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyway, but there is some benefits to nose breathing, but children specifically nose breathe. And it's because their airways are smaller. Their mouths are smaller. Uh, they also have larger tongues, proportionally larger tongues, right? Yes. That plays a factor for a couple of reasons. One, obviously that can become an obstruction, mm -hmm. right? And two, again, because they have a tongue filling up their mouth, they breathe through their nose because it's harder to just oxygenate their, air, their airway that way. Um, they also they have, have a more rostral larynx. And I know what two of those words mean. <laughs> <laughs> so do you want to walk me through? Sure. What a rostral so, larynx rostral is? Rostral essentially just means anterior. So their their larynx is more is more anterior than than seen in adults. And and that plays a factor if, if you're if you're a medic or someone who intubates, you know that someone who's like has an anterior airway when they're late, it's it's harder to get so to. So it's closer to the front. Right, exactly. Instead of posterior, right. which would be closer to the back. Yeah. So if you lay a patient down and it's more anterior. So okay, so if it's more anterior when I'm standing up. Yes. When I lay down, it's it's up, right? It's up high. So if I'm yeah, looking yeah. down so in if the I'm airway, animating, it's like way above me, sort of. It's not above you. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know what I'm saying. It's a like, yes. It's higher up, and therefore the hole is harder to see because it's a rostral. Obviously, obviously, I knew what that meant. Right. Obviously, um, they also have so, and all of these these differences, as as you can kind of assume here, that like they make they make maintaining and managing the airway from an EMS perspective more difficult, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So more anterior, more rostral. The other thing is they have a, like an angle, they have angled vocal, like an, not vocal cords so much as like an angled airway. Okay. So whereas an adult airway, you can picture it as like a cylinder, like it's kind of like a straight down cylinder. A pediatric airway is more cone shaped. So, so funnel, it gets funnel shaped. Yeah, funnel shaped. So it gets more, it gets smaller as you get farther down in the airway. Why that makes a difference is a couple of things. And I actually just ran, I've taught this a long time and just ran into this for the first time clinically in the ER, like maybe a couple of weeks ago. The narrowest portion of an adult airway is the vocal cords. Yes. It's a cylinder, right? It's a straight down tube cylinder. Once I get past the vocal cords, because it's a cylinder, I know I'm good to go. Right. In children, in pediatrics, the most, the narrowest portion of the airway is the cricoid cartilage, which is below, which is below the glottic opening or exactly. where the vocal cords are. Right. So that being said, when you pass a tube through the vocal cords, you may then have it get stuck on the cricoid cartilage. Now I've taught this for a long time. I had a drowning, I had a three-year-old who was a, actually a pretty terrible case, but we, I mean, we got him back and it was a blessing in that way, but we had a three-year-old who drowned and I intubated him without difficulty, but then we started having a lot of trouble with the airway. And I had to move to a smaller tube, not because I couldn't pass it through the vocal cords, right. but because I couldn't get, I couldn't get it like where it needed to be. And it was because of You're that. Getting caught on the I was getting caught on the cricket. So this right? is interesting too, because I want to emphasize this for you medics out there. Like I, I think sometimes we're trained to um, basically use the biggest tube we can possible in adults because if we can get it in then hey more bigger tube more secure more, in some ways yeah, yeah more air right we're passing more air if a bigger tube so it's a good thing right. let's get the biggest tube we possibly can only weak medics intubate with these small tubes because that's all they can get in right like we kind of make those comments we, we kind of shy away from I think using like the legitimate calculation for getting the correct tube based sure. on the size of the patient and stuff so then what happens is if we take that and we transfer that same technique to pediatric, well, now I'm using the biggest tube I can get through, but it's what I can get through the vocal cord. So I'm more likely to get caught, which is why in pediatric patients, it's really important that we're using the correct algorithm and we're calculating what tube to use. We're not just using street cheats like the little finger thing. Mm -hmm. yep. Now, easiest way to do this is your Broswell tape or your my medic card in our, in our case in Michigan we have like my medic cards i know a lot of states have the equivalent of it where it kind of gives you a breakdown through the brazil tape of you know what meds you give a what meds you give different pediatric patients what their normal vital signs should be because they're not things that we have readily available all the time in our mm -hmm. he, in our heads right so these cards and these brazil tapes will tell you what size tube to use based on the weight of the patient right. and that's the best way to do it and this is why at least how i understood it maybe you can give some insight in this this is why pediatric tubes traditionally have been uncuffed because of getting caught on that airway mm -hmm. but i know that they are transitioning right now it might be a, a topic for later but transitioning right now into more cuffed pediatric tubes 
don't really know yeah, the I don't, science I don't it, either. I'd, I'd have to look at the research. But yeah, yeah, in this case, I was using a cuffed tube because that was what the Brazo tape called for. And I think that was my problem. It was the cuff that was getting, it was like even yeah. deflated, the cuff was the part that was getting caught. So yeah, so like I said, an interesting, interesting part of, of the pediatric airway. Um, those are kind of like the, probably like the biggest changes. What's nice is they'll always respond to positioning, right? So like we're talking about advanced airway stuff right now. Uh, or, or we we naturally kind of go into, okay, well, we're, this is complicated when it comes to intubation and things like that. But like in Michigan state protocol right now, I'm not even supposed to intubate a pediatric patient. If I, I only do that if I can't get good ventilation through a BVM and an OPA. Sure. So because, and the reason behind this isn't just because we're like lazy or we're all, oh, it's scary to intubate a kid. It's because you're bad at it. <laughs> No, that's what I'm getting at. No, it's not because of that. Um, it's because pediatric patients respond really well to just good positioning of the airway. Well, right? that makes sense because it, it, it's their airway anatomy that a lot of times is playing a, a, a larger role in the obstruction or in the difficulty with ventilating or oxygenating. So sometimes a simple chin thrust or you know head, head tilt jaw lift is plenty to not only open the airway back up, but also once that airway is open... The, the child will start to ventilate on their own again. So a, a, a baby, I've seen this happen multiple times where a baby or a child who's not breathing, just positioning their airway, not only opens the airway, but because it's open, now that child starts to ventilate on their own again. Yeah. I don't even have to back them. Right. And that's why I try to tell my guys all the time in trainings and stuff like that, like first thing you start with is get that baby up into a nice, you know, almost like tripoded like position, get them into a position where they're using their full lung capacity, open their airway up, hold it manually open, like, you mm -hmm. can get these patients a lot of times in a good position where they'll kind of self-resolve the issue because of that anatomy. Yeah, so absolutely. Important things to remember. So the next thing we want to talk about is gas exchange and kind of how that works. And mm -hmm. the reason we bring this up is because I think that there's a big habit of we throw a pulse ox on a patient and we say, 100%, everything's good. They're ventilating fine. They're perfusing fine. Everything's good to go. So you speak really well on this. I've heard you speak this way in, in classes and stuff like that. So why don't you kind of explain the four aspects of gas exchange sure. so that we can kind of get a little bit more of an overall picture of like what's going on. Sure. So I always talk about assumptions. We make assumptions in medicine in general, which is perfectly fine. Um, like, But we do that a lot when it comes to gas exchange and perfusion and ventilation, which I'll talk about here. It's okay to make assumptions as long as we know we're making them. So... The four different attributes or, or components of gas exchange are ventilation, perfusion, diffusion, and oxygenation. And they each, they, they're obviously all, they all coincide. You know, they're all meshed together, but they are different things. And the tools we use to measure certain aspects of those things, we then use to assume other things. Okay, right. so I'll start here. Simple form is, is ventilation. Ventilation is simply the movement of air in and out of the lungs. It doesn't mean oxygen is getting to the tissue. It doesn't mean that there's gas exchange in the alveoli. It just means that there's air coming in and out of the lungs. Now, where it goes after that is that, but again, so ventilation is just that movement in, in and out. Well, I think it's, it's to simply break this down. It's to just say that I might try to solve a perfusion issue with ventilation and that's not going to help really, right? Because if, if I'm putting all the air in and that's great, but I don't have good diffusion or I don't have good movement of fluid to deliver that oxygen, well, I'm not handling the real underlying problem, right? right? And that's kind of what you're getting at. Yeah, so that's ventilation. So oxygenation is that oxygen part, right? So oxygenation is the exchange of oxygen in the alveoli and the blood. So oxygen is getting into the blood, okay? That's what oxygenation means diffusion is the ability of that oxygen to get from the alveoli to the to the bloodstream right. so oxygen is it, oxygenation is is the blood getting oxygen to it and diffusion is that process of it going from inside the alveoli to inside the blood finally perfusion doesn't actually have anything to do with oxygen perfusion has everything to do with is there blood flow to the area that we're talking about. If right. I'm perfusing the lungs, it means I have blood flow to the lungs. Does that blood have oxygen in it? Well, that would be a question is, is it oxygenated? Did it get oxygen in it? That would be... Uh, the diffusion. If it diffused yeah. in there, yes. 
And did the air get into the alveoli to be able to do that? That would be ventilation. So the, the two most similar are oxygen and diffusion. And I think that's where it kind of gets people. But like an example of where oxygenation and, and diffusion come into play, where, where you, you might be seeing one but not the other, would be like a, like a CO poisoning or something like that, where you have something that's, uh, that's binding to hemoglobin instead of oxygen, right? Mm-hmm. So chucking oxygen at that, works long term but it is a long term fix right because it's not it's we have to fix the diffusion issue or if you have like a like a pulmonary issue well, where you have you have water in the alveoli yeah. which we'll talk about right if you flooded the alveoli now we can't have we can't have that exchange right so we right. can't have good diffusion we can't get the the oxygen into the blood but we have decent oxygenation i'm giving them 100% oxygen all the oxygen's there it's just not transferring to where it needs to be, right right well that's the thing too so then then it, we, we understand those definitions but then we don't i don't think we always recognize the assumptions we're making based on the tools we have so when we measure a pulse ox a pulse oximeter we are looking usually in the finger or the earlobe basically like does that well actually we'll get into this but basically basically what we're trying to measure is does that blood have oxygen in it right the problem is, is that the pulse ox doesn't actually measure oxygen. It measures saturation of hemoglobin. Right. So your carbon monoxide is an example of that. Carbon monoxide binds to hemoglobin. Okay, so my pulse ox might read perfectly fine, but I'm not getting oxygenation to my tissues. My perfusion is probably fine, meaning that I'm getting blood to those areas. But, you know what I mean? like, And here's another example, too. I can have my oxygenation can be fine. If I put a pulse ox on somebody who's having a heart attack, they're probably going to have 100% oxygen, right? We then say, oh, they're perfusing well. Well, sure, they're perfusing that hand well. Are they perfusing? Are they getting blood supply to their coronary vessels? No, because there's a block there. So we just have to understand like what we're saying and what we're defining. Yeah, what we're right? measuring. And just like Chris said, uh, and I love that quote. I use it all the time. I teased him before this about it, so now I'm feeling bad about it. But <laughs> he, he does say, you know, it's okay to make those assumptions. Just know what assumptions you're making. And I think the the bottom line to that is use all your tools. We have a lot of tools available to us, and some of our tools are how we assess, right? So don't just throw a pulse ox on somebody and go, oh, it's in the 90s. I'm good. Throw a pulse ox on somebody and then think critically of what happens. What else can we look at? How are they breathing? How is that ventilation? How is air moving in and out? Are their lung sounds clear? Is there something that could be affecting diffusion? Is there something that could be affecting the fluid flow or the perfusion? So we need to take a little bit more of a global look at respiratory emergencies in general for both adults and peds in order to really get down to the to the nitty gritty, what the problem is, what the underlying yeah. and, cause is. And I think one of the big messages here is that don't rely on your pulse ox to be your measure of ventilation, perfusion, oxygenation, and diffusion, because <laughs> it's not, right? So even, I mean, that's why we use capnography. If you want to talk, and this is an NREMT question, if what is the most accurate way of measuring someone's ventilation, it's capnography. Because as soon as I stop breathing, I'm not going to blow off CO2 anymore. My pulse ox, though, is going to probably be 99, 100% for a good minute or two before I've used up that oxygen in my bloodstream where it's going to measure. So if I throw a pulse ox, if I hold my breath right now and you threw a pulse ox on me in 20 seconds, it's going to read 99%. Am I ventilating? No, not at all. I'm holding my breath. So like, right. like again, you can't use your pulse ox for all those things. Someone who's ventilating well, who's breathing air in and out fine and who has blood flow to their tissues, no problem and doesn't really have a problem with oxygen but has fluid buildup in their alveoli and can't diffuse that oxygen across is going to have basically oxygenation type issues shortly here, but giving them more oxygen is not the answer, right? right? They don't need more oxygen that we need to move. We need to mobilize that fluid. So again, we just can't rely on all that. We can't make those assumptions across the board every time. Yeah. And I'm a nerd about this, but it's, it's making me think, um, you know, about like our, our elevation stuff, like the issue there isn't Mm -hmm. necessarily, the amount of oxygen, but it, the amount of oxygen relative to other things you're breathing in. You know what I mean? It's not necessarily a ventilation issue. It's an right. oxygenation issue. And why is that? Well, because there's diffusion issues because the partial pressures. And you know what I mean? There's like yeah. tons of stuff that this goes into. And it, it kind of goes to show you these four things, ventilation, perfusion, diffusion, oxygenation. We really need to be kind of like zeroing in on all four of those and kind of checking them off when we're evaluating respiratory emergencies. So let's take it back to peds because yeah. we want to talk about well, so so based so based on that preliminary like understanding of you know airway and how ventilation and perfusion all that kind of stuff works now we can start to make the decision whether or not is the patient in distress is the pediatric patient in distress respiratory distress or in the respiratory failure and 
we'll talk a little bit about what those two kind of things look like. But when we look at distress and failure, there's kind of like a bunch of things we can look at, right? right? I got a list here. I'm going to read them off and we're going to play a little game. You're going to tell me distress or failure. And the moral of this lesson you're going to find very quickly is that some of them are both because it's a continuum. All right. So increased work of breathing. I would call that respiratory distress in and of itself. Yeah. Because we would probably see like a depression or a respiratory depression issue if we started to fail, right? If we're decompensating. Uh, Tachypnea or tachycardia? Uh, That would be distress. Yep, because we're compensating still. Our heart rate's up, we're breathing faster in order to compensate or make up for the lack of oxygenation, perfusion, whatever. Uh, Nasal flaring. Distress. Good, yeah, we still have the ability to try to pull in more air. Grunting or wheezing. This could be either, right? Because grunting could be a sign of like an upper airway obstruction issue, right? We're, We're having trouble. We have noises that are causing wheezing is a lower airway obstruction. That's concerning. Well, we can have those obstructions but be in distress or failure. So we got to look at other things. Um, strider. Distress. Same thing. Yeah. Uh, head bobbing. Oof. I say fail- I say failure for head bobbing. Okay. If all of a sudden your head starts to, because that's not necessarily like compensatory. This isn't like tripoding or belly breathing. Like this is like, I am losing my cool. Okay. <laughs> you know right. I mean? So I think that leans more towards failure. Use of accessory muscles. We could say either. Right. 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 Um, Typically, if we start to see like use of accessory muscles and then they stop being used, uh oh, we're really circling the drain now, right? right. Cyanosis, uh, probably failure. Yeah, they're they're turning blue at this point. Right. That's concerning, um, especially cyanosis despite O2. So if they're yeah. cyanotic, we give them some O2 and they don't color up right away. Uh oh, now we got a problem. Uh, irregular breathing, we're always going to say is failure, right? Yep. Irregular breathing is probably caused by like a disordered control of breathing neuro issue, which we'll get into. And then altered mental status. Failure. Failure. Um, can't read my writing here, so we'll just ignore that one. Diaphoresis. Probably distress. I don't, yeah. It's hard to say. And, and I guess like the, the, the theme here is that it's a continuum, right? Right. And I think the theme here is reassessment. Right. I always say like if you have a patient who's having an asthma exacerbation and they're wheezing and you give him an albuterol treatment and they're not wheezing anymore and they feel better. You did something good. If you have someone who's wheezing and you didn't give them an albuterol treatment and now they're not wheezing anymore, that's actually worse. Right. Like, so, again, we have to take into consideration that reassessment piece um, and recognize that the, the there is a continuum of respiratory distress moving to failure. Right. So when like when you said when people start to slow their breathing down and we haven't intervened at all, that me, that's a sign of failure. Alter mental status, sign of failure. Circulatory compromise, failure. But again, some of these things we may see, like, you know, you know, the work of breathing or retractions. Well, it depends on where we're at in that, in that continuum. Well, and it's so important to realize that, like we said from the beginning, that these kids are going to crash faster because in adults, we, have, we can see this gradual change from compensation to kind of normal vital signs to decompensation we don't see that in kids so we have to be really familiar with these signs of distress and failure so that we can understand where they're at in this continuum right and really these are the most important pieces because if we assess a child's airway we go through our assessment techniques we understand perfusion ventilation oxygenation we can recognize distress versus failure if we don't know exactly what's going on, if we don't know the exact underlying mechanism, we're still probably okay because we know how to intervene, right? We know how to give oxygen. We know how to, but the next step is, can we deduct, you know, what, what is the underlying cause of this respiratory issue and this distress or failure? So there are four major categories of respiratory emergency that a pediatric patient is going to have, mm-hmm. right? We're going to have upper airway obstruction, lower airway obstruction, lung tissue disease, and disorder control of breathing. Now we get down to the nitty-gritty of we have used our assessment. We know lots of things about airway. We, we're, we're looking at distress versus failure. Now we want to f- figure out what the hell is wrong with them, right? right. Like what, what is the underlying cause, and then how can we fix that? And this part's so, not hard, no. really. I mean, like upper airway obstruction is going to be one of two things, right? It's either going to be a foreign body, like an actual foreign body, or like mm-hmm. the tongue, right? Like right. where like an airway maneuver is going to help with that. Dealing with our regular, the regular way we deal with choking is going to deal with that, or it's going to be an upper airway. So when we say upper airway, we we typically mean everything above the vocal cords, Mm -hmm. right? So if I have inflammation or swelling of the airways above the vocal cords, that's causing a problem with my ability to ventilate an airway. That's an upper airway issue. The two big ones besides foreign body obstruction that we're going to see with that in kids is typically anaphylaxis because we get swelling of our upper airways and that mm-hmm. constricts our airway down 
and croup, which croup is basically just a viral infection of the upper airways that does the same thing. It causes swelling and irritation and that sort of thing. So let's talk about how we would treat those things real quick just so we can cover them, right? So foreign body airway obstruction, we're going to use the Heimlich maneuver, back right. blows, you know, depending on the size of the patient, right? Yep. Croup, how would I treat croup in the field as a pre-hospital provider? So a lot of times, so, so croup basically, it's just almost just going to be like cool humidified air, right? Just to kind of like calm, like calm down that inflammation, calm down that irritation, to open that airway up a little bit. We end up giving them steroids in the emergency department, which decreases that inflammation over the course of the process. Again, just like any other viral illness, it will go away. It just takes time. And the reason we see croup in kids and we don't see croup in adults is we still, adults still get the same virus that causes croup, which is parainfluenza. We just don't have the small airways like they do. So they actually get symptoms from it like we do. So a nebulized oxygen, essentially. So just like nebulized water. If you Mm -hmm. just put water in there, you're giving them humidified oxygen. Uh, depending on your protocol, you may be recommended to give like racemic epi, like a nebulized epinephrine in order to like really open the airways up. Yep. You'd probably have to see a pretty extreme case, I would think. But these patients are going to be responsible or are going to be really responsive to just airway positioning. Right. Um, and the tell- they even tale- tell us like it, for some reason in medic school, like in the textbook all the time, they're like start a hot shower in the shower and then take the baby into the humidified area. But I just think that's creepy. Like, <laughs> hey. I'll tell you what, I'm going to treat your baby. Go ahead and start a warm shower for me and hand me the child. <laughs> like, you know, it's, yeah. A so weird. I'm just going to say, don't do that. A it's lot weird. of times too, is like these kids will come, like they'll wake up in the morning for whatever reason with croup, you'll it like, will get triggered early in the hours of the morning. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's a hormonal thing or not, but what happens is mom and dad are like, oh my gosh, my kid can't breathe. They put him in the car. They come to the emergency department. By the time they get there, because they've been out in the cool air, because usually it's a wintertime type of virus. There's a, by the time they get there, they don't have any symptoms mm. anymore. And the telltale sign of any upper airway issue is going to be strider. Yeah. Right. That inspiratory. It sounds like whistling sound. It sounds like this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Something yes. along the lines of that. Perfect. Yep. Um, but anyway, so racemic epinephrine, which is basically a nebulized epinephrine, even just nebulized, you know, like I said, water, like the humidified air. Uh, and again, in the emergency department, we're going to do steroids. Obviously, anytime you start seeing extreme swelling and things like that, you may want to preemptively intubate and, you know, you, you, depending you, on your protocols, if you can snow them and preemptively intubate and stuff like that, because you're worried about losing the airway. The and swelling. that would be when you start seeing those signs of failure, yeah. altered mental status, things like that. And your your interventions are not. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's better. And this is a this is a difficult call to make. Sometimes it's better to intubate before they completely lose their airway, because yeah. if it's caused by upper airway swelling, if you wait too long, you're not going to be able to pass a tube. So that, that can be difficult. That's a post radial thing. Contact your medical director and talk to them about yeah, yeah. what they want. And same kind of thing with anaphylaxis, right? If you have anaphylaxis causing upper airway issues, we're going to be doing epinephrine. Now in this, in this, it's going to be IM, yeah. be IM epinephrine, um, you know, Benadryl if we can, obviously there's probably IV, right? We're not going to give them anything by mouth. A lot of this too is going to be position of comfort. Don't do anything to aggravate them more mm-hmm. because the more we do in terms of like aggravation, the more irritated that airway can get. And we got to be careful right. about that too. And then we, we'd also do steroids too. Most yep. of the time pre-hospital we'll get that started. So a salumedra, like a prednis- prednisolone or prednisone we would probably move with. Um, so that's upper foreign body air restriction, croup, anaphylaxis. Those are going to be your most common. What about lower airway? So lower airway, obviously our telltale sign here is not going to be strider. It's going to be wheezing. So when we get down to the lower airways, the lower bronchioles, um, and alveoli and things like that. The two big things we're going to see are we're going to see asthma and we're going to see bronchiolitis. So asthma, obviously, they like said we know is an inflammatory, you know, autoimmune type of condition. Treatment for there is going to be what? We're going to do albuterol. We're going to do steroids. Atrovent sometimes. Like Atrovent, yeah, combivent if we need to, that sort of thing. Um, in severe cases of asthma, sometimes you'll see, you know, medical control call for magnesium. Uh, that's because magnesium at the dosages we would give it for asthma is caused from or it causes uh, bronchodilation. So it actually can cause some bronchodilation uh, similar to albuterol. So it's kind of like a last ditch type of thing. Yeah. But again, and asthma is essentially like bronchiolitis is inflammation of the bronchioles. Asthma is essentially inflammation of the bronchioles from an autoimmune disorder. There's also mucus production, which be- makes yep. another complication and with asthma attacks spasming. Mm-hmm. So it's just, yeah, the lower airways are too small and exactly blocked. right. So, so what do we bron- do? bronchiolitis, like the itis means inflammation, right? It's inflammation of the bronchioles. And that's another, usually like a viral condition that causes. And I always used to wonder like, well, what, you know, what distinguishes the viruses that cause croup versus the viruses that cause bronchiolitis versus the 
you know, the bacteria and viruses that cause like pharyngitis. I mean, like, like mm -hmm. they're all the same. Yeah. It's just where the inflammation where happens, right? Happening. So if it happens in the pharynx, it's pharyngitis. If it happens in the upper airways that aren't the pharynx, like then we would be croup. And if it happens in the lower areas, we call it bronchiolitis. So it, it's, you know, usually the same family of viruses causing inflammation. We define those based on where that inflammation is. Where the infection yeah, is exactly. Exactly. Activated. So cool. So that's upper and lower airway. Now let's talk about lung tissue disease. So lung tissue disease is basically inflammation or infection of the tissue itself. So not just the not in the airways now, but the actual tissue, which is going to be your alveoli and things like that. And the issue comes usually when we start getting fluid back up in the alveoli. This is where we start to get really symptomatic. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So lung tissue disease is going to usually be things like pneumonia which is a bacterial infection in the alveoli where you're going to have pus and infective fluid causing a diffusion issue and things like that. Um, or pulmonary edema, which is can be from, you know, flash pulmonary edema from heart issues or pulmonary edema from things like acute respiratory distress syndrome, where you get fluid back up into the alveoli, which again, doesn't cause a ventilation issue, doesn't cause a perfusion issue, causes a diffusion issue. The oxygen now can't diffuse across because there's water there blocking it. Yeah, giving more oxygen in this case isn't going to help them because it's not an oxygenation issue. The right, oxygen's right. there. It just can't right. get in now, there. So we, what do we do? We push the fluid. Right, yeah. Right. We'll try to push the fluid. So treatment, obviously, like pneumonia is going to be antibiotics, right? Now, always our first line treatment is going to be oxygen because not yeah, all the alveoli are filled with fluids. So if we can saturate the hemoglobin by putting extra oxygen into the alveoli that aren't flooded, that, sure. that can be beneficial, right? Um, pulmonary edema, th sometimes, like I said, if it's severe, we can use things like CPAP to kind of just positive pressure, push that back down in there uh, and things like that. Yeah. Again, from a pre-hospital standpoint, there's not a lot of interventions that... Well, I mean, CPAP is pretty significant when it comes yeah. to... Yeah. yeah, but I just mean like from like a pneumonia standpoint, yeah. I mean, like it's a, it's what a, are you going to do, yeah, right? The, so we're not treating the underlying cause. We're essentially treating the symptoms and that's and actually, keeping you stable. And that's an interesting thing because I remember I had a patient we who was really hypoxic, had pneumonia, septic, and we started giving antibiotics in the emergency department. And one of my residents said, well, you know, they're, they're not breathing well. Should we put them on BiPAP? Should we put them on CPAP? And I said, no, we should intubate them and put them on a ventilator. And they're like, well, why wouldn't you try BiPAP or CPAP first? I said, because what's the underlying issue? The underlying issue is, is the pneumonia, is the infection. Right. BiPAP is, can bridge a patient while things like steroids and that kind of, but like antibiotics take days to work. Right. So CPAP is not going to give me any, it's, it's only going to bridge me to intubate them because they're hyper, you know, so again, it, it's understanding how diffusion, perfusion, ventilation, all these things work and what is the underlying issue? Where is the actual problem? is going to kind of dictate what our interventions are. That's another Dr. Seitz ism that I quote all the time is he does the assumptions thing and then the CPAP and BiPAP should be a bridge to yeah, yeah. To the, more I got, I got my th I got my thing. I like so, it. No, I finally, the last thing here is the disordered control of breathing category, which is kind of a throwaway category in my opinion. It's like CNS neural brain things that are causing irregular respirations. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so people who are post-ictal, right? They're going to have... But again, knowing that there's a postictal period, patient had a seizure, they're going to have some disorder control of breathing, support the airway BVM, they will recover, is nice to know because then you're not going to intubate someone who probably in 15 minutes is going to be fine again, right? right? right. Um, increased intracranial pressure, we see like in Cushing's triad, um, so you get, you know, high heart rate, sorry, you no, get low, low heart, heart rate, rate, high blood pressure, and dis and irregular breathing patterns because there's increased intracranial pressure pushing down on the brain stem which is where your respiratory centers are um so that obviously if it's messing with the brain the brain is what tells you how to breathe right <laughs> so right. if it's messing with the brain you get start you start getting weird breaths so mm -hmm. cushion's triad we're gonna see disorder control of yeah. breathing obviously it's a cause different neuromuscular disorders as well would fall into this category things that paralyze the diaphragm like, like and beret Yep, exactly. You know, yep. Which I know about. We talked about before. Right, yep, yep. Gambare, <laughs> other like you know, other, other like autoimmune, like nerve type of demyelinating disorders and things like that can cause. So again, that that kind of like someone who's gotten like who's an opiate overdose, right? right? An opiate overdose. They suppress their respiratory drive because of the opiate receptors. Well, that would be put into this category too. Yeah. So again, is or poisoning? We talked about in our like rattlesnake or our snake envenomation stuff like mm -hmm. any type of poisoning or envenomation can can cause, can cause that because a lot of that the venom is designed to paralyze um in in a neurotoxin sort of way right. paralyze the diaphragm um mm -hmm. so dealing with that would be like get the antidote exactly to take them to exactly. the zoo so again and, and this is like I said you may find that if you go through that pediatric assessment 
you're going to intervene on these things before you really sometimes get to the diagnosis, right? If someone's hypoxic, you're going to give them oxygen. If someone has signs of shock, you're going to... So like the, the whole point of a, approaching the pediatric patient in this way, where we're assessing, figuring out if they're sick or not sick, figuring out if they're compensating or decompensating, intervening as we see things. By the time we get to this point... And we're like, okay, now I, you know, based on their wheezing, I think this is lower. Okay, they've got a history of asthma. Like, this is asthma. I'm going to give these other treatments now. We've also already started interventions that are going to hopefully prevent the patient from decompensating even even further. And that's really the goal of this kind of whole thing. And so. I think that if you can get this far, and, and if I if I call the ER and I can tell you, hey, listen, I got a child. It's a respiratory emergency. I think that they are in failure or distress, and I've broken it down into, I think it's a lower airway issue, and it, they're suffering from bronchiolitis. I mean, that's a huge amount of information yeah. to, oh, yeah, to yeah. give Absolutely. you to get the right, ball right. for treatment, and that's our job in the end. And just like kids decompensate quickly, most of the time, they respond to treatment very well also. So yeah. a little bit of oxygen, like airway positioning, like uh, uh, you know, an albuterol treatment, like these kids, we can turn these kids around really, really fast. So... Just as so, as I think sometimes like we almost say like, oh yeah, like I, we don't see kids, you know, have crazy critical emergencies. Probably because we're doing the right thing a lot of times, right? <laughs> like they they could they could if we didn't do anything. Right. But our treatments do work quickly. The, the the goal is get them there as fast as we can so that they don't decompensate further. And to do that, you got to have a strong assessment. You got to have an idea of what's going on with the respiratory system and signs of failure and distress. And you got to have a little bit of knowledge about the underlying pathologies, or at least the most common ones. Yeah, exactly. That's what we tried to give you today. Exactly. So, so part three will come out next. We're going to talk about shock and that'll be kind of our third part in this. So what about what we're going to do the same kind of thing, but with shock, right? We said respiratory emergencies and shock like states are the things that are going to put kids into cardiac arrest. We don't like cardiac arrest in kids. We're going to try to prevent it. So next time, uh, join us while we talk about pediatric shock. Uh, we want to thank Aries again for their sponsorship today. Check them out. AriesMedSolutions.com, yes. correct? A R E S. A R E S. A R E S MedSolutions.com. We really appreciate them and everything that they're doing for the EMS community as well. If you want CE credits for this, uh, for listening to this podcast and taking a quick quiz, go to GuardianCME.com. We'd love to see you over there. And uh, if there's anything else we can do for you, give us a call. Jason's phone number is. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. Stay sweet. Hey guys, thanks so much for taking a listen. Uh, if you are studying for the National Registry exam, we're here to help. We have a National Registry prep program uh, to help you pass that exam. Check us out at guardiantestprep.com. If you'd like continuing education credits uh, for listening to our podcast or watching this on YouTube, follow us at guardiancme.com. 100% free CAPSI credits. Uh, no matter what state or country you're in, uh, we're here to help. So again, we thank you so much for listening. We hope you have a wonderful week.